All right, let's get into the word. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Our text this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 1 through 13. The topic we'll find there is this. David goes out of his way to show mercy to the grandson of his former rival. The title of our message, Mercy Boku. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our time in the word this morning. We pray, Lord, that uh, it would be a rich time, a full time, a time in which the word becomes a mirror in which we see Jesus reflected and our own reflection becoming more like his. Lord, I, along with other saints here this morning, we want to leave this place looking and thinking uh, a little bit more like Jesus Christ as you are conforming us day by day into his image. We want to be filled and excited about our relationship with you, but we also want to be a channel through which we share that thrill and that excitement with others. Accomplish all these things and all that we don't even ask for, Lord, by your grace. We pray in Jesus' name and those who agree said, Amen. At some point in an interview, you can expect a famous person to be asked the question, what accomplishments are you the most proud of? I'm not sure what King David would have answered if he had been asked. He certainly had a lot to choose from. His defeat of the Philistine giant Goliath right at the beginning of his career is perhaps his most famous accomplishment, the thing that is known to believers and non-believers all over the world. His unifying of the 12 tribes of Israel would certainly qualify for a peace prize. His conquering of Jerusalem after centuries of failure was an incredible feat. Or maybe it would be his planning for and preparing for the temple that his son Solomon would build after his death. I'd like to think that David would mention what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 9, at least one of his greatest accomplishments, one of his greatest moments. I say that because as you're going to see this morning, David was never more Christ-like than he was in his actions towards Mephibosheth, who is the surviving son of Jonathan and the grandson of King Saul. David decided he wanted to show kindness towards any survivors of the house of Saul. As he seeks out Mephibosheth, we see God's grace and mercy towards us as lost sinners on display. And we're reminded, we who are saved, that we now have become the channels of God's mercy and grace towards all the others that he is seeking to save. I'll organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, God's mercy found you. Let him use you to show his mercy. And number two, God's grace fills you. Let him use you to bestow his grace. First of all, verses one through eight, let's talk about the mercy of our God. Now, we like to say that mercy is God not giving you what you deserve, while grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. It's a great definition, but how does it really translate into action? What do mercy and grace look like? They are on display for us in this text as David first shows mercy, then bestows grace upon Mephibosheth. If you want to know what grace and mercy look like, this is the place to go. Verse 1. Now David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Saul, as you recall, had made David a fugitive and had hunted him down to kill him for more than a decade. Upon succeeding to the throne after Saul's death, the normal thing for a monarch to do would be to kill any descendants of Saul's who might have a legitimate claim to the throne, especially after one of Saul's sons had been propped up as a king, creating a civil war situation for at least seven years. And so this is what happened in a monarchical society. You found all the descendants of uh, your rivals and you made sure that they could not ascend to the throne. Not only did David not do that. He actively sought to find a descendant of the house of Saul in order to show him kindness. The first thing I'd say then about God's mercy is that it is actively seeking people in order to show them kindness. God wants to save people. 
Dr. Norman Geisler puts it like this. He says, the truth is that God is more willing that all be saved than we are. For the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's justice demands that he condemns all sinners, but his love compels him to provide salvation for all who by his grace will believe. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I like what Dr. Geisler says there when he says, God is more willing that all be saved than we are. A couple of things I would say about that. Number one, it's interesting. Whole systems of theology have developed which restrict the message of salvation. They look at the Bible and they say, most people are not going to get saved. In fact, only a small group of people are going to be saved. And then they spin off their theology from there. In even if we don't believe that, even in our personal life, sometimes we work with people day in and day out. Our neighbors are there day in and day out. The people that we're around and we're sharing with them and, and we're not seeing a lot of result. And we can kind of almost get the idea that God's not working. He's not doing something. We forget that it is his desire to save. We need to have this outlook. We're not to be as results-oriented as uh, we maybe would be in the world. I mean, think of Jesus Christ. Think of his three-and-a-half-year ministry and the, the immediate result of that ministry. It was pretty pathetic. He got involved in his ministry. He prayed all night. The Father said, these are the 12 guys that are going to be your closest disciples. They're the ones that are going to carry on the message. One of them, Judas, would betray him. The rest of them, knuckleheads, in the nicest use of that term. They're always, they couldn't figure anything out until they uh, received the Holy Spirit, of course, later on. But, you know, and then Jesus there, dying on the cross. All of them had fled except for John. He could only look down and see his mother and say, you know, John, you take care of my mom. And, and, all. and so, you, you, you know, but from before the foundation of the world, he and the Father had an agreement. And Jesus trusted that the Father would use his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, to save untold multitudes of people, to make a way back into the presence of God. And so uh, the attitude we want to have is that God wants to save people. Maybe we don't see it, we don't see revival, but I think sometimes we pray so much for revival that it discourages us when more isn't happening. God wants to save people. And I think you should resist any theology or any thinking that says otherwise, that indicates that God is limiting what he wants to do. He wants to save. Now, as we work through these verses, bear in mind that there's going to be a double illustration for us. First of all, David is a type of Jesus Christ to illustrate God's mercy and grace towards all mankind. You'll see that. But second, David is also a type of every believer in Jesus Christ through whom God wants to show his mercy and bestow his grace towards all mankind. And so I look in what God has done for me, but I also see what God wants to do through me. We see in David what God did for us and what he can do through us for others. Verse two, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. When they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. David called what he wanted to do the kindness of God. He understood that he was to example for others the mercy and grace of God in a practical way activity. Uh, I'd like to think David came to this in his devotional time or in his times of prayer. And I, what I like about this is David doesn't come out and say, I, as the king, would like to do a magnanimous gesture to show what a great reign I'm going to have uh, or to care. He says, no, I want to show the kindness of God. When this is all over, I want people not to say what a great king David is, But what a great God uh, is David's God. Uh, And and so very interesting. It's easy to start to share the glory of God. 
people always, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between encouragement and flattery. But even beyond that, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you, you can be encouraged. You don't have to always, you know, run for cover when people are encouraging you. And we need to encourage one another. But sometimes you, you know, when you want the recognition, that's the problem. And you always know this when you do something. Uh, if you're ever in a group of three people and two people get named and you don't, then you're, you know, that's what you're talking about. Then you know that you are wanting some of this glory for yourself. And so be careful about that. Now, David wasn't just talking, and this is important, about random acts of kindness. That's a great thing, isn't it? There's a website, there's an organization, some of you probably a part of it. I think it's great. Random acts of kindness, I love them. Especially when they're done to me. You know, when you know, a person gets ahead, you know, you let, oh, you go ahead in line. You know, you have less things than me. Or, you know, you're at that, you know, the perennial four-way stop now at 12th and Grangeville where nobody can figure out what's going on. Oh, no. You know, and everybody's just going crazy. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You know, and, so, and, and random acts of kindness, they're wonderful. We, we need to commit to that. I, I have no problem with that. But that's not what we're talking about. David is talking about specific tasks that showed God had changed his life. Things that no one would do except for God. It's one thing to do a few kind things when it's convenient. What David did was show God's mercy by an act of kindness to someone he probably ought to have killed. To an enemy. At the very least, this was unexpected. And so we need to be thinking in terms of, Oh, that guy is the guy you want me to show mercy to. Well, that's another story. Or or this situation is where I need to example God's mercy. I ought to react this way, but this is how God wants me to react. So that's what we're talking about. Now, notice the condition of this son of Jonathan. He was lame in his feet. We learned why in an earlier study. At the death of Saul and Jonathan in battle, the nurse of this boy, aged five at the time, He fled or she fled with him so the Philistines would not find him and kill him. No mercy could be expected from the Philistines. But in her haste, she dropped him. And it must have been quite a fall because he was severely crippled for the rest of his life. We would say he was made lame through a fall. And so is the human race made lame through a fall. The fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But immediately, God came seeking Adam and Eve to show them kindness. Right there in the garden, while they were hiding from him, while they were lying to him, God promised them mercy and grace as he explained he would come in human flesh, he would die in their place to save them and to redeem them and to restore them. So the king, verse 4, said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Alan Redpath says that Lodabar means something like a barren land or a place of emptiness and dissatisfaction. Now, I'm repenting to you for what I said first service, uh, which is that this is Riverdale. (laughs) So there's my moment of repentance. Until you come to know Jesus Christ, the world is low to bar to you. No matter your achievements or status in this world, you were created to have fellowship with God. The book of Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in their hearts. Talking about the human race, Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has put eternity in your heart. And we sometimes talk about a, an emptiness in the heart or a void in the heart. Uh, It's not so much that as it is there's a place in the heart that knows that something is missing, that longs for something greater, something spiritual. And and so God has done this, and it indicates to us that you can never be whole or filled or satisfied until your heart is Christ's home. If you're not a Christian here this morning, if you never received the Lord, this is who you are seeking. It's, it's not in the material world at all. It's not in a relationship with anyone else other than Jesus Christ. Something I think that sometimes can temper our zeal as Christians is that we look at the non-believers we know and they seem happy and satisfied 
and full. In fact, when we get depressed about this, they seem better off than we do. They have more, they have this, they have that. You know, we, we get ourselves thinking that we're suffering so much for being Christians and these people are just better off. Or, or at least they don't seem needy. Their marriages aren't falling apart. Their children aren't doing terrible things. Their jobs aren't in jeopardy, etc. Don't let that fool you. It's all a veneer that masks a deeper need. Even if they would say, I'm satisfied. Jesus comes along and he says, what profit is it to gain the whole world and then lose your soul? And so we're talking about something that God has put in the life of a human being that is eternal. That obviously can't be fully satisfied or filled with any of the things in this world. No matter how emotional or or somewhat spiritual they seem, there's a place that only God can occupy and no one will be satisfied until he does. Verse 5, Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. About 20 years had passed since Mephibosheth had been crippled at age 5. He'd been hiding out, living in fear. I don't think it's going too far to suggest that those who cared for him and raised him spoke badly of David and convinced him that the king had it in for him. I mean, after all, they were hiding him from David as best they could. They were keeping him as far away from Jerusalem as possible. How tragic that so many children are brought up today in ignorance of the Lord and of God's word. Or they're, worse yet, they're taught by precept and example that God has abandoned the human race or is somehow responsible for most of its sufferings in the sense that, you know, if he wanted to do something about it, he would. You know, I'm not that old, but I can remember even in my lifetime, most children got some sort of Christian education as young individuals, whether they went to catechism or uh, Sunday school, even in the public schools, there was some understanding of a basic Christian worldview and perspective and kids knew basic stories. Uh, they, they knew who Jesus Christ was. Now the truth is, many people do not have the slightest clue what the Bible is, who Jesus Christ is, or anything at all about Christian uh, underpinnings. Uh, and so m- sometimes you, f- you feel, man, I'm not making any headway. I'm talking about Jesus. And, and really, the people you're talking to, they may not know that Jesus is even a historical figure. It sounds amazing, but it's true. And survey after survey and uh, poll after poll bring this out. Children are not hearing about the Lord in their homes. Uh, and and it's, you know, it doesn't make it impossible, obviously, for God to save individuals, but it's tragic. They're, they're like Mephibosheth. They're told nothing about God or that God is an evil force that we don't need anymore. And, and would to God that we would return to an understanding uh, uh, you know, uh, of the things of the Lord and teach our children. If you're saved, uh, you, know, you need to really be sharing these things with your children. David issued a call from Mephibosheth to come to him. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a call. It's a call to all mankind throughout all man's history to come. The very fact that God takes the initiative is a display of mercy that's unfathomable to our hearts, but nevertheless true. If you're saved, you can think back on the moment of your conversion and you'll see that God was searching for you and he was calling to you. Maybe you were saved as a child. You don't remember a moment of salvation But you know that someone was being used by God to call you to himself. Your parents or someone else, a Sunday school teacher, was asking you, do you want to give your little heart to Jesus Christ? Do you want to come to know the Lord? And and you said yes. That's because God's calling most often comes through a person preaching the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 2.14 you read, To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't mean that it was his gospel. He meant it was his preaching of the gospel. He's the one that brought it and that is what God used to effectively call many of the Thessalonians. Verse 6, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, 
had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, here is your servant. David called him by name. It reminds me that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to any member of the human race who will believe. Those who respond, they're saved and their names are listed forever in his book of life. Verse 7, so David said to him, don't fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Commentators like to point out that David showed Mephibosheth kindness for the sake of someone else, he says. It's an illustration of God the Father accepting us for the sake of Jesus Christ. For example, in Ephesians 4.32, you're reading along and then it says, even as God in Christ forgave you. It was for the sake of Jesus Christ that God forgave you. Now, that doesn't mean that God didn't want to forgive you or that he's forced to forgive you against his will. A lot of times... We have kind of this pop theology that we grow up with that the God of the Old Testament is a really cranky old man. He's throwing stuff down at people. He created the human race for target practice. I mean, you know, that kind of thing. And then luckily Jesus comes along and he says, hey, dad, you're going to have to go through me if you want to kill anybody. All right. You know, and stuff. People got saved in the Old Testament just like they get saved in the New Testament. They believe God and it's accounted unto them for righteousness. If you're not a Christian here today, you believe God. Not in God or about God. You believe God that you're a sinner and that you need salvation and He saves you. And there's just as much grace in the Old Testament in some senses you would say more because they had less of a revelation. And God still saved them. He was still seeking to save them. The idea here is that Jesus died on the cross. He took our place to satisfy the just demands of the holiness of God. God wants to forgive, but he can't overlook sin. And so Jesus says, I'll go, I'll become a man, I'll be the God man, I'll die for sin, I'll take their place, I'll be the substitute, so that now you can save and satisfy both your holiness and your love. And so for the sake of Jesus, we're accepted. Shown mercy and bestowed with grace. Verse 8. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Mephibosheth sees himself as he truly is before the king. There was nothing he could do about his parentage or his crippled condition. Think about Mephibosheth. Nothing he could do about the fact that he was descended from King Saul and deserved to die. Nothing he could do about being crippled, even more so in his society than in ours. And so he realizes this maybe for the first time before David. Likewise, you and I, we cannot change the fact that we are the descendants of Adam and Eve and we have been crippled by their fall. You can argue all you want, but you inherited a sin nature from Adam and Eve. And you know that it's true because you commit individual acts of sin in your life. Uh, people think this is unfair, but when you get into the New Testament, there's a whole other teaching, but wow, it's an incredible thing because if I am in Adam and Eve and I, you know, can be seen in them, I can also be seen in Jesus Christ as the second Adam, the Bible says. And so what happens to him also happens to me. And what happens to him is that he's raised from the dead and I am given resurrection life to live this life as God intended. And so when you got saved, or if you're not a believer today, when you get saved, you see yourself as you truly are, as a sinner separated from God, deserving of judgment and its punishment. You understand that nothing good dwells in you and that there is no single good work or compilation of good works that can save you. You understand that you are absolutely at the mercy of God. And then you understand what a great place that is to be because God is so infinitely merciful. He sought you in his mercy to save you. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son so that you would believe in him and not perish and have everlasting life. As majestic and marvelous as all that is, it's not the end. It's only the beginning because next God makes you his agent, his representative on earth to reveal him to others by showing this mercy to them. 
Not just by telling folks that mercy is not getting what they deserve, but by personally not giving them what they deserve in your own interactions with them. If you're following what we're saying, you know that it's something that cannot be done in any human strength. But in the Lord, you can be looking for those he is looking for and show them the kindness that real mercy produces. And that brings us to our talk about grace in verses 9 through 13. Not getting what you deserve, that's half the story. Getting what you don't deserve comes next as God bestows his amazing grace. Verse 9, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. Mephibosheth had been living in exile for no good reason. David restored him to his family's inheritance. God loves to restore. Now, it doesn't mean he's obligated to restore everything you've exiled yourself from before receiving his mercy. Sometimes people, they're in a terrible circumstance. Family life or business or something else is falling apart. They come to the Lord. The Lord uses that to show them their spiritual need. And God loves to restore and he can restore. That's a testimony that many of you have. Your marriage was falling apart. Your life was falling apart in a particular area and God restored it. But there's no promise that each particular part of your life is going to be restored because there are other people involved as well. Other hearts, other individuals with free will. We don't come to God and say, God, I will come to you if you will restore all the things that I want you to do. No, we just come to the Lord and then he restores and gives more beyond and we see how that all works out. But overall, I would say it is God's desire to restore and many of you, including myself, can testify to his restorative powers. Things that you, in a sense, worked hard to destroy. God is able to restore. And in many of our lives, he's done it multiple times. We keep challenging him and tempting him. And the Lord is found merciful and gracious each time. Verse 10. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. And you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Two worlds are depicted here in this verse. There is the everyday world of their agrarian society in which crops were planted and harvested. That world would have its ups and downs depending on circumstances, depending on the weather and different things like that. Then there is the world of the palace in which a table was spread bountifully every day despite the temporary circumstances outside of the palace. So too with us there is our life as a pilgrim and stranger journeying homeward to heaven. It's filled with circumstantial ups and sadly downs. Some of those downs are pretty deep valleys that you may have to travel through for many years. In fact, for some of you, they're caverns. They're below the surface. I mean, you're in a dark place in your circumstances. But simultaneously, there is the realm of fellowship with God. He walks with you, does he not, through the valley of the shadow of death? In that realm, you have God's bounty from grace. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is super abundantly available to you, the Bible says. Many of you have experienced that. You've read it in the testimony of other saints. Uh, It's true. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my Lord, the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Now, this is the third of four times in these verses that we'll read something like he shall eat at my table. It's in verse 7, 10, 11 and 13. It's to remind us that we were created to know God and to have a relationship with him. More than that, the relationship is to be a joyous one. It's like sharing a feast with him where he is the host and we bring only ourselves and he supplies everything else in super abundance. And more even than that, he looks upon us as if we were his own sons because we're in his son, Jesus Christ. And so this is what God is portraying to you as a relationship with him. He says, I want you to come. 
It's be like you and I having a meal together where I provide in super abundance all the things that you would ever ask for or need or desire. And sometime during that meal, you're going to realize that I am treating you as if you were my own son. Just I love you just as much as I love my son, Jesus Christ. Wow. This is what it means to know God. And so verse 12 Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All who dwelt in the house of Ziba were the servants of Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth had a son. We know nothing about him except we read in 1 Chronicles 8 that he had a son and grandsons. In other words, uh, you know, you read this and you think, what's that all about? Who cares that he had a son? Well, all I can tell this morning is that we see again the emphasis on the home, on the family. We would hope that Mephibosheth would now raise his own son very differently than the way he had been raised. That he would raise him to love the king and understand his mercy and his grace. If you have children, it is job one to reveal God to them, to lead them to faith in Jesus Christ. I know you love your kids, but love them enough to realize they are hell-doomed sinners and that they are on their way to a Christless eternity unless they accept Christ as their Savior. You see that they're hell-doomed sinners. You know it. From the time they're babies and just won't stay on a schedule till the time you're saying, no, please, no, don't you understand? I'll have to spank you. Oh, no, don't do that, no. And they're doing it the whole time. Why are they so defiant? Why are they like that? Because they are born dead in trespasses and sins. They're little sinners. And you have to tell them, you're a little sinner. And you need salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh, self-esteem. No, it's, it's reality. You need to lead your kids to Christ and then raise them in the ways of the Lord. Uh, you know, don't, some of you, you know what I'm talking about, you first generation Christians and you thought, man, why didn't my parents tell me this? Where, where was this instruction when I was a child? You know, sometimes we give testimonies and I've said this before. It almost sounds like we enjoyed our sinful life. Yeah. You know, back then before I was saved, blah, 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 you know, and stuff. And you're talking about all the things that you did and you out drank everybody and out smoked everybody and out raced everybody. You out everything to everybody, but then God saved me and now I'm happy, you know. <laughs> That's a typical testimony because you think, I have to really get into it. You know, this guy, this unbeliever needs to know how bad I was so that he can believe God saves him. A lot of times, I had a guy one time when I was a salesman, he, he, he said, I don't think I need the Lord. I said, why? And he goes, because I'm not as bad as all the people who need the Lord. <laughs> That's the only testimonies he ever hears about people who are down below the gutter. And they, of course, they need Christ, but I don't need Christ. I'm a more normal person. And so that's not the point. And so, you know, I can honestly say, looking back at my life, I wish, and this isn't a, I love my parents, uh, you know, this isn't against my parents, but I wish that I had some knowledge of Jesus Christ and that I had been raised in a Christian home. Every terrible thing that I did during those years, uh, I wish I didn't do. Uh, none of it is fun. None of it is. Uh, I don't want to go back to any of it except for what God brought into my life and restored to me. Uh, and so raise your children in the Lord. Now, all who dwelt in the house of Ziba would serve Mephibosheth. It reminds us that God is causing all things to work together for good for those who love him and in the called. In other words, Mephibosheth, he's just living his life. He's in the palace. He's being fed. And then all around him, God is working things out. But it's always according to God's purposes, because as uh, later on in the life of Mephibosheth, you're going to see that Ziba will slander his master and spread a lie that he has turned against David at a time when everybody turned against David. But Mephibosheth reacts in a godly manner, retains his integrity and grows up in maturity. All things were working together for his ultimate spiritual good. And so verse 13, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was lame in both his feet. An alternate translation says, even though he was lame in both his feet. And that suggests a couple of thoughts. Number one, even though he was lame in both his feet, handicapped and deformed, David had no objection to him coming to the table. 
It is true and cannot be emphasized too much that God receives you just as you are. If you're not saved, or if you know people who are not saved, don't waste any time thinking that you're going to clean yourself up and then come to God. Or get ready to come to God. You've talked to people like that. You've invited them to church. You say, oh, you know, the walls would fall down if I walked in there. Ha, ha, ha. You know, and they say, well, I'll, I'll quit doing this or I'll quit doing that. I'll clean myself up a little bit and then I'll come and, and know. The, no, just you better come right now. You don't know how much time you have, for one thing. But you can't really clean yourself up anyway. That's the whole problem. God saves you and then he starts from within and he changes you from within. Even after you're saved, we struggle with this. Maybe you fall into sin or you're backslidden and you think, well, I, you know, I, just, I can't really just come back to God. I have to do penance. The only penance there is is repentance. You just repent and come back to God and start where you left off. Maybe there will be some consequences from things that you did. That's a reality of life. But God receives you just the way you are. Don't waste a moment trying to get ready to come to God. Just come. And then it says, even though he was lame in both his feet, Mephibosheth made his way to David's table every day. Now I want you to hear me on this. Think how difficult it would have been for Mephibosheth or how embarrassing it would have been for him. We don't normally think about this. He's handicapped. He's severely handicapped. As far as I can tell, there was no... American Disabilities Act in that time. The palace probably had lots of steps, no wheelchair ramps because there were no wheelchairs. And so for a handicapped person to get to the king's table would be very difficult to say the least. Some of you who have handicaps or work with people who have handicaps, you know that you can't just, you know, just do things that you want to do. You've got to plan for them. You've got to think about them. You've got to really you know, work these things out. Or there's embarrassment sometimes. Yeah, I don't want to be carried to the king's table. Here comes all the king's mighty men and all these people are coming to breakfast or dinner, whatever the meal is. Oh yeah, there's Mephibosheth. You know, four guys are carrying him. It's awkward. Where's he going to sit? Does he need a special chair? You know, those kinds of things. Nevertheless, he found his way to David's table. And it speaks volumes to us. You and I must overcome any of our, pardon the pun, pun, lame excuses for missing out on fellowship either with God or with his saints. A thoughtful person could look at King David and in his dealings with Mephibosheth see God's dealing with them and with the entire human race. This is the gospel being illustrated. Just as David showed mercy and bestowed grace, so does the God of Israel, the King of Kings, seek you out to show mercy and to bestow grace. And as we've said, the illustration doesn't stop there. David also illustrates the life of a saved person to whom God has shown mercy and bestowed grace. That person is to be God's channel, God's conduit, his representative through whom he does the same for everyone they encounter. How do you tap into all this? What activates it? Well, you simply accept the invitation. David was inviting Mephibosheth to this life of feasting at his table. I say he could have refused. Think about it. Here was David inviting him because of mercy and with grace. If Mephibosheth declined, would David have him incarcerated? Would he have him assassinated? I mean, David didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm the king. I have to invite Mephibosheth to show what a great king I am. Get that guy in here. You're going to sit at my table or else I'm going to kill you. No, he, he found him. He searched for him. And he brought him and he called him by name and he said, I'd like for you to sit at my table every day. I'll take care of your inheritance. I'll see that that's care. I'll do everything. All you have to do is come. And you know what? It's an invitation. It's free, like a gift. And Mephibosheth, I think he could have said no and it would have broken David's heart. It would have broken God's heart. He could have stayed in that lame condition, living in low debar. It was an invitation that he ought to accept. And in his case, he did. If you're not a believer, this is the invitation of God. He is inviting you to come and be full of Him. If you're a believer, here's something else to consider. Often, long-standing invitations can begin to take a lesser priority. I mean, if you can go and do something anytime you want, 
then it's not as attractive. It, it kind of loses its luster as opposed to something that, you know, only happens once in a while. And that's, you know, God is so gracious. He's so gracious. He says, you can come to me any time you want. We'll spend time together. God has no schedule, I guess. He doesn't have a date book. It's just, I'm always here. Wherever here is, I've got, if this is your prayer closet, or if this is your gathering place, if this is your church, I'm there. And, and as great as that is, we, it works against us sometimes because we think, well, I could spend time with God, but I don't have time right now. I'll do it tomorrow or the next day because He's always there. And so there's an exhortation here for us to say, hey, are we coming to the table? What about my devotions? What about my church attendance? I, you know, we don't take attendance here. Well, I do privately, but uh, that's not true. You know, I mean, we're, we're as gracious as we can be, but this is just between you and God. How much are you availing yourself of this gracious invitation to spend time with him and with his people when they gather together? So figure it out and then come just as you are to the feast. Get filled. Go inviting others to do likewise. Let's pray.